Undoubtedly one of the greatest pop producers of all time, Grammy Award-winning producer Timberland changed the way both rap and R&B sounds. Responsible for countless records, he produced for a wide range of top-tier artists from Jay-Z, Justin Timberlake, Beyonce, Nelly Furtado, and is responsible for the sound of Missy Elliott and Aaliyah, to name a few. This man is the go made beats from whatever he can get his hands on and is known for turning beatbox sound effects from his mouth into hit records. This is the story of Timberland. Born Timothy Z. Mosley on March 10th, 1971 in Norfolk, Virginia to Graceland and Latrice Mosley, Timberland is the oldest of their two sons. His father was an employee of Amtrak while his mother ran a homeless shelter. At a very early age, his parents knew that he had a passion for music. As he grew older, he attended Salem High School of Virginia Beach, Virginia, where he himself said he wasn't the most academically sound student. His mother said that his academics was average, at times below average, so Tim focused never on being a scholar in high school. Another notable producer, Pharrell Williams, attended the same high school with Timberland. Pharrell mentioned that Timberland was shy and stayed to himself a lot. One thing that brought Tim to life was the music. Pharrell would say they had a class together and Tim would make beats with his mouth on the desk at times. Creating music was so deeply engraved into Tim's DNA that he would constantly find ways to make beats. Then came along SBI which stands for Surrounded by Idiots. I don't know who came up with this name, and surprisingly, it wasn't Pharrell's idea. <laughs> Magoo, who is another staple in Tim's early life, stated that SBI's motivation was just to create great-sounding music and loving the culture. SBI's intentions were to be a rap group, which eventually did fizzle out. All the while, Tim was a DJ, going by DJ Timmy Tim, he would begin to make a name for himself at parties. DJ Timmy T would give out and sell mixtapes to friends at his high school, further putting his name out there as a DJ. His mixtapes would receive great reviews from his peers. Tim would also go on to state that he didn't profit off of his mixtapes like he knew he could have, but it was the thought that he was building upon his craft that was much more valuable to him. Although Tim was DJing and wasn't making as much money as he liked to support himself, he eventually would get a job working at Red Lobster as a dishwasher. One night after Tim was finishing a shift at work, one of his co-workers was showing off a pistol that he got. Tim, not thinking anything of it, knowing his co-worker was just trying to be a show-off, clocks out of work to go home. As his co-worker was putting the gun up, it fired off accidentally hitting Tim in the neck. He was taken to the hospital where doctors didn't know if he would make it, but Tim eventually made it out alive and charges weren't filed against his co-worker. This incident caused Tim to be paralyzed in his right arm, which prevented him from being able to DJ like he did before. He scrambled trying to find out what he was going to do now that his arm was stuck in the sling, but he never gave up trying. He even tried to DJ with just his left arm. It took Tim about two years of painful rehab to get the mobility back into his right arm. No matter how much pain it caused, he was going to fight to get back to doing what he loves at a high level. This should be an example for a lot of producers out there to not let anything get in your way of doing what you love, which is creating music. Then came the late 1980s. Magoo introduced Tim to Missy Elliott, who was a part of the group named Phase E, who were from Portsmouth, Virginia. The very same day they were introduced, Tim and Missy Elliott would hit it off with the music. Tim would make a beat using his Casio keyboard at the time, and Missy Elliott would sing to it. You can only imagine how amazing that was to hear. After that day, they would link up time and time again, creating music constantly. Almost instantly, they developed a chemistry between each other with the music. Tim stated that Missy was a sister that wasn't from his mama, so they were really tight. 
Missy Elliott and Phase E would go on to sign a deal with Swing Mob and Devontae Swing, who, if you didn't know, was a member and producer of Jodeci. After she signed, she went out her way to make sure that Tim could be her producer, which ended up happening eventually. In the early 90s, Timberland was signed on and was a part of the Basement crew, joining artists such as Genuine, Missy, and others. It was at this time Devontae Swing would name his protege Timberland after the Timberland brand of construction boots. He didn't care about any of the conditions he would live in. This man only had a blow-up mattress near a hot water heater with little to no money and food to eat at times. But Tim didn't care as long as he could do what he loved, which was create music. What's amazing is that Tim being through a struggle countless times for him, this wasn't new. He already had the tools to grind through it. If anything, it just made him more hungry. This would teach him what the grind really is. Timberland would make beats for all of the artists, and later, Timberland would eventually get some money into his pockets when Swing Mob released hits from Genuine, Player, and Jodeci. After a few years with the Swing Mob, Timberland eventually left, moving back to Virginia where he began to produce music on his own. It was said that Missy Elliott left first, and knowing the chemistry that her and Tim had, there just wasn't any way that he was going to stay with Swing Mob. Tim stated that he never felt so happy in his life. Not long after his departure, Timberland would get a call from Atlantic Records, who had a superstar on their label by the name of, you guessed it, Aaliyah. Atlantic was adamant about getting Tim to work with her. Atlantic wanted to find Aaliyah a new and refreshing sound for her second album, and who better than Timberland to create that sound for Aaliyah? In a meeting with Timberland, he played beats for Atlantic, who would state that Timberland would play a series of beats unlike anything they've ever heard, which later made it really easy for them to link Tim with Aaliyah. Atlantic would pursue Missy Elliott, knowing the chemistry that her and Tim had over the years working and creating with each other, in which Missy didn't hesitate to join in on the opportunity to work with Aaliyah and her brother Timberland. Before their first meeting, Missy wasn't sure how their interaction would play out, being that Aaliyah was such a superstar at the time. But when they all got into the studio, it was almost magic from the start. They hit it off like they were family. Fast forward, and it's time for them to put in some work. Tim and Missy trying to figure out what they're going to create went back to their days with the basement crew, a sound that they created which the world didn't know about yet, and they had the luxury of using it all with Aaliyah. Tim, being the genius he is, took all types of sounds and effects from animal sounds and baby cries, beatboxing. I mean, the man used any and everything at his disposal to recreate that sound from the basement crew days. Fast forward again, August of 1996, Aaliyah's classic album drops, One in a Million. We all know the gravity in which this album had and its effect on the culture. One in a Million was a huge success. Not to forget that Pony dropped the same year, which again, is a classic. Tim and Missy, having produced the majority of Aaliyah's album, which was a success, decided it was time to move on and work on Missy's debut album. Keep in mind, this album had only been worked for only two weeks. Let me say that again, just two weeks. Missy's album, which had the widely known record, you know it, Super Duper Fly. In 97, Super Duper Fly debuted at number three on Billboard 200 with 129,000 copies sold in the first week, becoming the highest debut for a female rapper at the time. The album remained on the chart for 37 weeks. It was at this time Tim began to receive inquiries for his talent. He began to work with more and more well-known artists. Around this time, he linked up with Jay-Z producing Big Pimpin', which still to this day is a classic. And then, the most dreadful time in hip-hop history, Tim, Missy, and the culture took a major loss. Then the chilling footage of the crash site in the Bahamas. Aaliyah and eight others on board the twin-engine Cessna were killed in paradise. They had just finished shooting another video. 
But while some are wondering whether the plane had been weighed down by too much equipment, possibly causing one of the engines to fail, for those who knew Aaliyah, no explanation will ever ease the pain of their loss. An icon, Aaliyah, lost her life in a tragic plane accident after filming her last music video, Rock the Boat While in the Bahamas. This was a very sad time for those closest to Aaliyah, including Timbaland, who took on the role as her big brother. Tim stated that she's a part of my heart, a very big part of my heart. So losing her for him, you can imagine, was devastating. 2002, Missy Elliott drops her fourth album, Under Construction, which also became a success due to the work Timberland put in with it. This album went on to do numbers, selling 259,000 copies in its first week, and the album ended up going double platinum. You may remember the record, Work It, from this album, which still is a classic. Later on, Timberland would meet this kid by the name of, yep, <laughs> Justin Timberlake who at this time was starting to work on his debut solo album after leaving a pretty successful group by the name of NSYNC. The two would link up in the studio one day working on some songs and out come the hit record, Cry Me A River. Keep this in mind for later on in the video. Now, as time progressed, Tim would work on records for both Magoo and Bubba Sparks. These records didn't sell well. Now, was this a byproduct of Tim's work or... Was it the artist? Most would like to believe that it was the latter. Either way, Interscope wasn't having it, and they dropped his group from the label. It was at this time people started to feel like Timberland lost his touch and that he wasn't it anymore as it pertained to producing hits. Keep in mind, this was at a time when if you were not pumping out hits, you would be put to the side for someone else to come in and produce those hits. Timberland being the person he was, didn't listen to all the noise, but kept working despite the non-believers. Although he kept trying, his music wasn't hidden. Then Timberland fell into a deep depression, causing him to gain a lot of weight, 400 pounds at one point. He even said that he had become suicidal. Then something came over him to where he started to change his life. He began to work out and lose all the weight he had gained, and now that he was starting to get back to who he once was physically, his music would begin to do the same. He linked up with an artist by the name of Nelly Furtado, who was working on her third album in which Timberland produced two number ones from it, that being Promiscuous and Say It Right. Timberland then linked back up with Justin to make Goes Around and a dance classic, Sexy Back, which became a number one. So all this time, people were on Timberland's case about him being cold and washed, not being able to make any more hits. He comes back and drops hits all over the place. Mind you, all this isn't easy to do by no means. Fast forward again, Timberland never stopped producing. In 2013, Jay-Z got a group of well-known producers to work on his album, one of them being Timberland. Of course, this makes sense because Timberland has produced a plethora of notable songs for Jay. He'd help out with this album greatly. Then in 2014, Timberland links up with a young up-and-coming artist by the name of Tink. Timberland was excited about this opportunity to work with a female artist that can both rap and sing. Tink was and still is a dope artist, by the way. Tim and Tink linked up and Timberland wasted no time in trying to get Tink's foot in the door of the music industry with some of the biggest names. He tried to get Tink on a song with both Jay-Z and Rick Ross titled Moving Bass, where Jay-Z was on the original hook by himself. Timberland, having produced the record, felt this was a great time to get Tink on this song. Jay-Z was okay with the version with Tink on it, but Rick Ross heard it and wasn't a fan of it at all. So much so to where he addressed Timberland for playing the record with Tink on it while being interviewed at the Breakfast Club. Now I'm not gonna lie, I personally liked the version with Tink on the hook mixed in with Jay-Z with the back and forth kind of sound to it. You really never know, Tim may have been on to something with it. The world will never know now due to Rick Ross pulling the record with Tink on it from his album. It's sad, but... Tim tried time and time again to get his artist Tink on records with notable artists, but it just wasn't happening like he envisioned. Not giving up on her, Timberland did eventually sign Tink to the Mosley Music Group. 
Fast forward to a well-known event, South by Southwest, and Timberland and Tink share the stage. But that isn't the only thing that is shared. I don't touch baby girl's record. You all know that's Aaliyah. I was riding home one day, sleep. She spoke to me in my sleep and said she's the one. They premiere a song that Tim sampled, which is a classic, one in a million. Now this has disaster written all over it from the beginning. So many people who held Aaliyah in high regard were hearing a record they loved, sampled, and this new artist who they may never even know about. This moment was another turning point for both Tink and Timbaland as the record would receive backlash. Even I was confused when I heard the record. After a few years with Tink and failed attempts to Timbaland's standards of dropping hit records in 2017, they parted ways. The world may never know the true potential of Tink, but let's wait and see. Nowadays, Timberland has been low-key for the most part, but he's still working. As of 2019, he did a masterclass in which he explains his process in full detail, and recently, since the dawn of the pandemic and COVID-19, Timberland and Swiss Beach both put their minds together and started what we all know now as the versus battle. All the greats come together versus each other with nothing but hits. I must say this is a genius move by both Tim and Swiss because these versus battles have been a really big success. Well, <laughs> except the Teddy Riley debacle in which we all know how that played out. <laughs> I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? You can't hear me? I'm talking. Can you hear me? Trying to talk. Can you hear me? Nevertheless, they're entertaining and much needed during the time we're currently in. So thank you, Timberland and Swiss Beats, for being the masterminds behind these battles. Also, Timberland does have a Twitch where he streams himself and others producing and making music. The lesson here is this. Despite all of the setbacks you may have in life, continue on with doing what you love. Also, producers, take this major key from Timberland who said... Never say your beat or song is a hit because you just don't know. This is important because a lot of producers stifle themselves because they made what they think is a hit. Don't stop there. Keep producing and make more beats. That's really it up to this point. If I missed anything, feel free to let me know in the comments section. Also, let me know how you feel about Timberland and his legacy. Was his music an influence in your life? Let me know. I really thank you for watching this video. If this video was cool, please like it. If you want more videos like this one, be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications. Until next time, blessings.